Welcome to Hip Hop Now Podcast. If you're from the future, you know what to do. Get your ass out of here. Don't disrespect the legend. Hip Hop is here to stay. Let's get right into the business. What up, y'all? I am your host, Vegas, and this is Hip Hop Now Podcast, a bonus episode. Specifically, brought to you by the people over at patreon.com slash hip hop now. And if you would like to learn a little bit more about that, click the link in the description of this episode. Bonus episodes are always fun. Patreon supporters get to hear it first. Get to watch it first. <laughs> but what I what I enjoy the most is chopping it up about hip hop. And sometimes the podcasting, the hip-hop social media can be a bit much. People like to argue and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's all about the enjoyment, the discussion, the debate of hip-hop. I do it with sports, so why should hip-hop be any different? Now, I know how I feel about these lists. These publications do these lists. And sometimes, you know, we argue about the lists. Even myself, I react to the list sometimes in negative ways uh, <laughs> because some some things are difficult to understand. Well, I have decided to do a couple of lists that I think uh, I've never really done on the podcast. You know, I've, I've kind of flirted with a couple of things, you know what I'm saying? Um, but I never really wanted to commit to these are my top five albums. These are... Uh, top five MCs. These are the top five beats. Like I never really wanted to do that, only because, uh, you know, it's 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 my opinion. But also, I can't ever make my mind up. <laughs> now I could say this is my top five albums, and then shift the order all around and stuff like that because I can't decide which one I like the most. Blah blah blah. So what I've done is I'm going to do a series, top five albums, top five uh, hip hop artists, and top five beats all time. Now, of course, this is my opinion. And also, it's probably leaning way more towards favorites, but nothing that nothing that I mentioned as far as the music, as far as the uh the beats or the albums or the artists they all appear in somebody's top five top 10 top 20 whatever it may be so you're not going to hear me say kick cutty top five dead a lot like you're just never going to hear that because who does that (laughs) it's not going to be me um so again here's my criteria as we talk about the top five hip-hop albums of all time in my opinion and probably definitely my top five favorite um a lot of what it has to do with none of it has to do with sales most of it has to do with impact on me and i mean significant impact not just a good album not just a classic album not an album that everybody likes but when i first heard it how did i feel about it Was I, did I feel my blood pressure rising as I went from song to song because I thought it was so great? What feeling did it give me? You know, that's kind of where I'm coming from when I talk about the impact. What was the impact on me as the listener? Um, And it's the same for you, for your top five. So let's see if your top five is my top five. Obviously, of course, uh, I want you put your top five albums of all time in the comment section let's talk about it let's talk hip-hop right let's get right into the business though so at we're gonna start at number one because you know i mean honestly if you know me if you're watching this right now (laughs) you already know where i'm going with my number one and it doesn't mean that one album is better than the other. It's just the order I decided to put them in based off of uh, 
what I was thinking at the time when I wrote the list. So at number one is Ice Cube's death certificate. Now, I wrote a whole chapter in my book about this album when I purchased it, my feelings at that time and all that good stuff. But why do I feel like it's a top five greatest hip hop album? Well, I came up in a time, I'm gonna just go with the old head energy. I came up in a time where, you know, albums were journeys. They weren't just a collection of dope songs, right? That wasn't really what you call the classic. They were really like skits, variety and rhymes, variety and beats, concepts. They were really like, put it this way, because I'm gonna go, I think I said this before on the podcast, like threads and sheets, right? You know, if you know sheets when you go buy them, somebody just go buy sheets and go get Fanny Dye, go get some sheets. Then they wonder why they slept on it for a week and it's starting to thin out. Because the threads are light. It's like 10 threads, sheets. I don't know if they make those, but you know what I mean. Basically, it's going it's going to be cheap. It's going to wear out. But albums back, specifically back in the 90s, were 3,000 threads. I don't even know if they make those, but you get the point. It's an album that's being created in such a way where nothing is just, oh, put that on here or just throw that on there. Everything has purpose, right? The skits have purpose. The inflections in the in the artist's voice, the features, you know, the the arrangement of the songs, the album cover, right? The who you choose to produce, what they produce for certain songs, how do they match up with the concepts? Like everything is done with a certain level of quality and uh, attention and care that is just made for great experiences. And again, this was at a time, Ice Cube's death certificate specifically, this was at a time where, you know, music didn't, artists didn't release albums that frequently. If they released an album, it was out for a couple of years before you heard something else. Sometimes some artists, you know, would would hit you back in like two years or whatever with a new album. Um, But majority of the time, you knew if Ice Cube had that new album, you wasn't thinking about what was the next one because you were kind of living with that. And with Ice Cube's death certificate, it's sort of like a crossroads album between a guy who is growing up in the hood and South Central in a hood and he's writing about all the things he sees, experiences, the people who live there, their motivations, lack thereof, um, the things outside of the hood that affect the people in the hood, typically in negative ways. Um, and it was also a transition from Jerry Curl Ice Cube to now he cut his hair and he's rolling with the Nation of Islam. So there was, uh, the first side was more like Hood tales, or the the light side, because that's what it was referred to on the cassette, which I had the cassette back here. Um, and then the dark side, ironically, well, actually, the dark side was the A side. The light side was like uh, knowledge of self side, right? Where you started to look more deeply outside of your hood, and he talked more about the things that were affecting them, right? So the first side is really more about what's happening. The second side, what's a day in the hood, basically. The first side is more like a day in the hood. It, it's, you know, it's going to the clinic for STDs. It's, you know, selling drugs out of state. Uh, it's steady mobbing, like a, just a day in the hood. It's, it's all of that. And the light side was more like, you know, songs like us. They, they, we blame the white man for everything, but there are things that we do that we need to uh, change and look at each other at. Um, songs like True to the Game, where it's sort of like guys who make it and sell out, right? Um, even a controversial song like Black Korea, which at the time was very controversial because um, Ice Cube was be call- being called everything at that time, anti-Semitic, you know, everything. Um, and Black Korea, you know, was about, at least on the on the West Coast, uh, these Korean grocery stores that were all in the hood, 
but the owners never really had any respect for the community itself, right? So his words were more so like anger towards being profiled rather than uh, just a hate record, right? I won't say a hate crime because he didn't commit no crime, but it was looked at as if it was a hate record when it wasn't really about that. It was about a reaction to how you're being treated in your neighborhood, right? So, and you know, obviously, you know, was it every single Korean store in South Central or in LA at the time? Probably not, but it was enough for it to be uh, common, you know, so to speak. So this album is so dope because it just has so many different looks as far as the the production goes. Um, And probably, one of the things when you think about all of that that comes from this one album that stood out to me the most was the fact that it had one of the greatest if not the greatest disc records of all time at the very end and it was more so like we did all of this with this album but I forgot one thing and it was an answer to NWA on their um, album Niggas for Life going at Ice Cube because he had left the group so they was calling him like Benedict Arnold and we're going to cut your hair and you know you're going over there to New York Cats um, one interesting thing that Ice Cube said a long time ago I just saw the, uh, the interview recently was that when he left NWA he originally wanted Dr. Dre to do his solo album because he figured well my beef is not with you and the group is really more so with Easy and Jerry Heller and the type of business they were doing. But I guess we could still work. And I think, you know, even though he didn't get into it in that particular interview, um, he kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, Dr. Dre was just trying not to be that guy, probably because he knew what was being said within the NWA camp about uh, Ice Cube and it would have made him look funny to go and produce Ice Cube solo away from ruthless records but again one of the greatest disc records of all time one man against an entire group and nwa was at the height of their powers do not be mistaken uh the album niggas for life was just as hot if not better than the debut and it did not have ice cube on it so it was it was it was powerful and it was crazy to go against a group like that um but he did it and it was on this album and it capped off an album that would have been great without it so that's why that's my number one my number two the notorious big or like back then we used to call him biggie smalls we still call him big big or whatever ready to die why this album is so impactful or was for me was I love the way it told a story from beginning to end. Again, like I said, in the 90s, albums were experiences. They weren't just a collection of songs. Sure, there were singles plucked off of certain albums um, and, and put on the radio, but they were a part of a full story when you got the album. And that was kind of what was dope. It was like the, the gateway into the project. If you like the single, you go listen to the album and you experience it. And for Big, it starts off with you know him being born, and um, eventually it, it ends with in this skit or this intro with him coming out of jail. The I guess the the CEO Rick Ross, not just playing, <laughs> saying you'll be back, and he like yo you ain't gonna see me no more. And it's really more about the next step in his life. And what's so dope about that is I was approaching uh, graduating high school. And I had committed like in junior high school to to really like, yo, I'm gonna a, I'm a graduate high school, I'm gonna go to college. So mentally I, I wanted to rush my life. And it was albums like this that gave me perspective on, you know, going towards your journey, right? He's leaving prison. He's like, I'm never coming back here again. And mainly you're thinking because I'm going to be this big rap star. So I remember the first time, 
you know, I heard things done changed. And what was so dope about that record to open the album was like the especially the bar. Step away with your fist fight ways, mother. This ain't back in the days, but you don't hear me though. It was kind of a sign of a new generation, right? Yeah, back in the days, it was all, you know, put your hands up and fight and maybe even shake hands and then become friends or whatever. But in the 90s, it was more like there were more guns on the street and it was sort of like dudes would just shoot. And it was a reality, regardless of how you feel about it, it was a reality. And I think that's what I liked the most about Biggie's album because it not only told his story about his relationship with his moms, his baby mother, and um, the storytelling, like song like Warning, you know, songs like Warning was just so dope because they were coming from a tradition of hip hop artists before him, like a Ice Cube, like a Slick Rick, who had told these tales, tales from the hood kind of situation. And it was what was so dope about Warning, it was almost like listening to a movie, right? And the video sort of did some of that too, but it was just so dope. The beat was so dope. Um, the fact that Method Man was on there from Wu Tang was hot because you you just never thought about that collaboration. That beat was hot. Um, and probably my favorite song, besides like Unbelievable for obvious reasons, on this album is um, Everyday Struggle. And when I talked about, you know, me being in high school and being close to close enough, you know, I was like a year or two, or probably a year away from graduating. I was just, it was just really like that song spoke to me. And I was, I was never no drug dealer. I never sold nothing. I never had to go out of town. I never had to be on the corner, but I felt what Biggie was feeling in that record. You're trying to make it. And you're starting, not at the end, but you're not even on the line for the race. You're just trying to make it, not at the end of the line, but the front. You, you're trying to get to the front from not even being on the line because of circumstances, right? A lot of us grow up in the hood. It's not just not having opportunity, but not even knowing that you have opportunity because in a lot of cases, sometimes, and I'm not speaking for everybody, including Biggie, um, you don't have examples around you, right? So the examples around you are like my man over here, he getting all this money. He's able to pay the rent. He's able to take care of his kid and he's selling drugs. And he like, here, no job interview, right? No pro no resume required, just you're hired, right? So I love the beat. I love the storytelling. In that record, I love the way Big conveyed it. And, you know, even like ending with suicidal thoughts, you know, with a guy who's committing suicide because of, you know, he can't handle life around him. And again, like I said, with the intro, it starts with him being born. And suicidal thoughts ends with him um, basically shooting himself. And the album is called Ready to Die. And there's, that's a theme throughout, throughout everything and um, throughout songs like Juicy, stuff like that. So again, one of the greatest hip hop albums of all times for all the reasons I mentioned, but specifically an uh, impact that it had on me and why I related to a lot of themes that didn't necessarily mirror my life, but I could understand. And that's why I liked it. Next up, Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation of Millions hold us back this is Public Enemy's sophomore album and it is one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time not that far back I did a bonus episode on albums that just sound good like when you put them on it's just the sound quality is so great you know it's just from front to back you just love listening to it even if you're not listening to the lyrics, you're not doing things with the beat, you know, I'm doing hand gestures for those who are, for those who are listening. Um, and 
when I first heard it takes a nation of millions to hold us back, it was the same feeling, except this was coming more so from a, um, a black power, black pride, um, the almost militant hip hop standpoint from Chuck's voice being as powerful as it is as uh, Flavor Flav adding a certain level of flavor to the ad-libs, right? Uh, Terminator X doing what he does, the production from the Bomb Squad, um, who also did production with Ice Cube. Like, it just felt, it's an album that feels and sounds powerful, right? Now, some people will just throw certain words around, right? They throw classic around, they throw goat around. They, they throw hot around like everything is that when they like it. this was more than like this when an album just makes you think it just makes you think about the things around you it makes you think about the things that Chuck D is saying that maybe you don't know about so now you feel like you're learning from Chuck D to me that's what this album was and even the videos right um, Night of the Living Bass Heads right a video that's playful, but about a very serious topic, right? Because everything he's saying is true. And more importantly, me growing up in New York City and Brooklyn around that time during the crack era, a world, he's describing a world I see every day walking to school, right? With my little sister sometimes, like I'm seeing these things all the times I'm seeing it around, I'm hearing my my parents talk about it. You know what I'm saying? Um, elder elder people, like older people, talking about it. So, just not even just that records like that. You got the Terminator X record, like it's just so many records on this album that have a certain level of power in how it's approached. And I just remember when I first heard this joint. Even the way it starts, it just sounds like a, the world was opening up for me at that time as a young listener to details about topics, you know, that either indirectly or directly affected me. And on the hip hop side, there's no way beats alone you listen to this album and don't think it's dope. Just beats. Then when you listen to the potency of the lyrics, the variety in the songs, like watching Channel Zero, stuff like that. It's just, when you hear people say, this is a classic album, or this is one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time, you hear it instantly. And that's kind of the thing I was talking about before, right? Like with uh, Death Certificate and with Ready to Die. It's just a certain way that these albums pull you into the content. And by the time you're finished with it, that's when you leave saying stuff like, yo, that's a fantastic album, greatest album of all time, stuff like that. So there's that. Uh, two more. This one, if you're watching the video, it's right behind me. Into the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. Listen, y'all, listen. When I tell y'all this album, not even, let's just not even the album. This is also, this is a chapter in my book that hasn't been released yet, but pretty soon. Just hearing some of these beats is what really just blew my mind at the time. There was plenty of rappers rapping back then. You know, early 90s, there was a lot going on, you know. A lot. Tribe released their um, third album, Midnight Marauders, same date. But prior to that, I knew the other album I was picking up was the debut of Wu Tang Clan, and it and it was one of those things where you just had to be there to feel the energy of this album before it released. Hearing beats like Cream, Can It Be? ahead of time protect your neck method man it was like i haven't heard a wax song yet and when i get home and i press play 
and I listen to the first record, Shame on the Nigga. I'm like, what is this beat? It sounds like Game Show with Karate and the old Dirty Bastards like singing, rapping, and it's just, it's just something that wasn't happening. And to speak to the greatness of not only RZA and Wu-Tang Clan and what they brought to the game, but again, this is during a time and this same thing happened before that with you know groups like Das Effects and um, artists like K Solo. It was almost as if you couldn't bite anybody's style. You had to have your own style. You had to be original. And it was like you had to have a gimmick, but not in a negative sense, right? It was just a style. It was something that you did that you were strong at that you basically patented while releasing your music. So for like Das Effects, it was the Iggy, and everybody thought that was ill. When K-Solo was out, everybody thought that spelling in your rhymes was ill because nobody else was doing that, right? It was a style. So when Wu-Tang dropped, and now they incorporating kung fu films, the nostalgia of kung fu films that all of us had watched in the hood, you know, Saturday morning or whatever, or Sunday afternoon when all that stuff used to come on television. Um, and here they are sounding like the biggest fans, but they're also the biggest fans of hip hop. And it's all kind of put together like the mystery of chess boxing. Like it's, they bringing in all these elements from not just the neighborhood, but just culture in general chess kung fu flicks hip-hop soul like everything and then being led by artists that we were kind of familiar with like i remember when protect your neck came out and i think jizza has the best verse on that <laughs> but i remember when protect your neck came out and i was like yo that's the genius but somehow he's way better than what i remembered and it took me a minute to realize that uh, RZA was Prince uh, Rakim. Because I remember that song from back then, but I didn't put two and two together. Because um, I didn't remember the video, so seeing his face didn't, you know, jog my memory. But just the fact that they knew each other, oh, wait a minute, they're related. And, oh, they, they're from Staten Island. Like, who's from there? Like, it was, it was kind of crazy. And I just remember, you know, going through that album and, like, how iconic the skits were. I remember that album drop, man. You go to school after that, back then in 93, and everybody's talking about how funny the you know, where my killer tape at God, and, you know, just the lack of, um, I guess, uh, resources to, to have a gun sound. So, you know, <laughs> Riz is like, you know, uh, give me that, oh, okay, blah. Like, and then everybody's acting like he got shot. I'm like, whoa, actually, he just made a gun noise with his mouth. But it didn't matter. We thought it was dope. You know what I'm saying? So, Into the Wu-Tang 36 Chambers, uh, definitely an impact album and one of the greatest hip-hop albums of all time. And the last one, I'm not going to hold y'all. I debated big time for this. And I didn't really feel like, well, should I add something newer? Because it's there are plenty of albums that are newer that are classics, right? But top five, and top five for me, is Kendrick Lamar's Good Kid, Mad City. And not just for music reasons, but for what has been the theme of this top five. Albums that tell a story. Now, typically, debuts, especially back in the 90s, were always the best albums because they were, it was the time where the artists got to tell you their journey. And what I loved about this is when Kendrick released this album, not many albums were doing what I described from the 90s. Not many of them were journeys. And we got to the point where albums even from some of our favorites like jay-z and nas became more of a collection of songs and less of a story thread throughout the album and good kid man city was the best way kendrick could tell his story so what i liked about it was that he was a new cat doing something old school 
right? But in his way. And I wasn't prepared for the skits that told the story. I just knew I liked certain records he released, certain singles, you know, like Just Don't Kill My Vibe and, and records like that. Um, but I just wasn't prepared for what was on there, right? Drake was also on there with Poetic Justice. That joint was hot. Um, and MC8, you know, the, the title record, Good Kid, Man City, Mass Confusion, baby. Like, it just was such a dope journey. Kendrick Lamar is not only pinning his story, but there's he's flexing, you know, the, the party records that aren't really designed to be party records. They're just a part of what he's talking about, where he is at this part in the story on the album. I always say with Kendrick Lamar, it's tough to listen to a first single sometimes and really like it because you know it fits somewhere within the story and you don't have the full context. So you might feel like, I don't know if I really like that one. And then when you hear it within the context of the album, you're like, okay, I get it now. Now, now I like that record because it like that record. But you ain't like that record. All right, sorry. Uh, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It was just one of those things where I was proud because it felt like hip hop was uh, coming full circle with someone from the new school carrying on tradition because that's what he was doing with this album. So whereas it worked well for uh, a younger generation, it was dope for them to experience what we had experienced for years with albums like Death Certificate and Ready to Die. Um, and I, I kind of feel like, sure, there are a number of albums. I have a lot of music. And there are a number of albums I love that, um, you know, do so many great things as far as beats and rhymes and um, establishing styles and all kinds of things like that. But at the end of the day, when I start to think about other classics from Eric B and Rakim and BDP, and Dr. Dre's The Chronic and Doggy Style and stuff like that, a lot of them do some of the same things, but I only could choose five, and those are my five. So what are your top five hip hop albums of all time? What are some of the reasons you choose those albums? Are you like me and you have a personal attachment to the stories being told within the album? Leave your comments in the comment section below. Until next time, y'all, I'm not a critic. I'm a fan. Subscribe today. Peace.